And people would tell me, oh, stop running, stop running. And I just kept doing it, basically. As a man sucks the air out with a vacuum, inside that suitcase, the forensic officer found the torso of a man. Known as one of Canada's most prolific criminals, he will go down in history as one of the most disturbing individuals to ever walk this earth. On July 24, 1982, Luca Rocco Magnata was born Eric Clinton Kirk Newman in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. It's a seedy district of Toronto, and the same area that the notorious Ken and Barbie killers Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka lived when they began their crime spree. Scarborough is known as the bad side of the city, so growing up in the area brought hardship to many. Luca's parents, Donald Newman and Anna Yorkin, had several issues of their own. Donald struggled with his mental health for most of Luca's childhood. Anna was a germaphobe and led a strict household, mostly homeschooling Luca and his siblings until 1998. She often locked the children out of the house and punished them for the smallest of messes. A girlfriend of Luca's said he would tell her that his mother sexually harmed him when he was younger and how obsessive he was with serial killers, especially Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. He also penned blogs on MySpace under the name Vladimir Romanov, saying his mother was extremely manipulative and had him in diapers until the age of seven. The blogs also claimed he was harmed by a male relative and used money he made as a prostitute to take his mother on lavish vacations. Growing up, Luca thought he was better than everyone else delusionally creating alter egos and separate lives for his own entertainment. When his parents divorced, he moved in with his grandparents, Phyllis and Walter Yorkin in Lindsay, Ontario, and began studying at a regular high school, but was constantly bullied and beaten up by the other kids. Still, he persisted to believe that he was superior and destined for fame. In 2001, Luca headed to downtown Toronto to search for stardom. However, he quickly learned that it was harder to achieve than he thought. He turned to work as an escort and dancer, appearing in two adult films by 2003. He was on the hunt for money, and he would scam anyone. He tricked a mentally disabled woman into going home with him where he hurt her and stole her identity, plus thousands of dollars. By 2004, he received his first criminal charges. In 2005, Luca appeared in Toronto's Fab magazine. As one of Toronto's largest gay news outlets at the time, they released an issue bi-weekly for almost 20 years, showcasing male models. In Luca's issue, he went by the pseudonym Jimmy, claiming to be from Russia with a goal to become a police officer. Photographer Tony Fong described him saying, I remember his dark hair and that he was kind of good looking compared to some of the other fab boy models at the time. I think he said that he had recently lost a lot of weight and he told me he wanted to get into modeling. At the same time, Luca was dating a woman named Julie who claimed he was extremely narcissistic and passive aggressive. He never wanted to be intimate with her other than holding her hand and was obsessed with posting photos and videos of himself on social media. He created over 70 Facebook profiles and 20 websites, many of them with his own name and picture, some with completely different names and backgrounds but still his own pictures, and others with completely different names and pictures to catfish, create clout by spreading false rumors, and to create false praise for his modeling career. In 2006, Luca legally changed his name to Luca Rocco Magnata and found himself traveling to various countries as an escort. He also attempted to compete in Out TV's reality TV show, Cover Guy, and Slice Network's Plastic Makes Perfect but failed to get past auditions. These failed attempts would turn Luca into an even darker version of himself. In 2009, after failing to achieve any type of notable fame, Luca began posting videos on his social media with much darker content, including a man getting bitten until he no longer lived, and animal cruelty. He may not have been getting the attention of Hollywood, but he was getting the attention of a major group of animal rights activists. At the end of 2010, he posted a video called One Boy, Two Kittens, which depicted kittens suffocating in a plastic bag. 
as a man sucks the air out with a vacuum. This disturbing video became viral in all the wrong ways, as everyone on the internet was wondering if it was real or not. Animal rights activists created a Facebook group, Find the Vacuum Kitten Killer for Great Justice, and the organization Rescue Inc. pledged $5,000 for anyone who could provide more information on the killer. In Netflix docuseries, Don't F*** With Cats, Hunting an Internet Killer, we were introduced to the individuals on the internet who began investigating the kitten video, including Deanna Thompson and John Green. The members of the Facebook group dissected the video, attempting to figure out where the individual in the video lived. They began with the account he posted the video on, and noticed it had zero followers but had liked the trailer for the film Catch Me If You Can. They also noticed the video had a Russian television sitcom playing in the background. They quickly realized this person was methodically messing with everyone in an attempt to hide his real identity. Shortly after that, a fake account posted a link in the group to another video of the same person playing with the dead kittens, a photo of them in a fridge, and a full-bodied image of the person holding the cats with his face blurred out. It was clear that the person sharing this content wanted infamy. Joe Panzarella from Rescue Inc. discussed the videos with his sister, a psychologist, who told him that these videos were for attention, and this person showed clear signs of them becoming a serial killer. The Facebook group exploded with thousands of followers, and Luca posted once again another fake account with a message, I step on little kittens and make videos of it. The fake account also posted a video of someone setting a cat on fire in a cage. These horrific posts led Joe to simply ask the fake account if they were the creator of One Boy, Two Kittens. To which the fake account replied, Yes, I kill kittens. LOL. The group attempted to track him down and eventually found that many of the account's friends were from Namibia in South Africa. Since the first name on the fake account was Jamzy, they ended up finding an individual with the same name in Namibia and began harassing him to the point where he took his own life. Several people who did not partake in the lynching, like Deanna and John, were horrified to find out what had happened. Once the lead went cold, another fake account DM'd several group members, telling them that they had the wrong guy and they should be looking up someone named Luca Magnata. Ironically, Luca was so obsessed with his own attempt at fame that he was giving himself to the internet sleuths. As Deanna and John began Googling Luca, they were shocked to see the excessive amount of accounts related to him and all the rumors and accolades that people were writing. The pair created a Facebook subgroup called Luca Intel with a few of the level-headed members who they trusted and began sharing the information they found on Luca. That same video of Luca auditioning for the Cover Guy reality TV show led the group members to discover the show was based in Canada. Plus, they began noticing the photos were highly photoshopped and the supposed online fans were all saying the same things about him. It became obvious to them that Luca was creating a fake life for himself on the internet to seem like he was some great jet-setting model with lots of friends, when in reality, this person was not mentally stable. Deanna discovered a video online from a Toronto news outlet called the Toronto Sun, where Luca was being interviewed about the idea that his association with Carla Homolka was ruining his modeling career. She began searching his photos for their EXIF content, which sometimes provides the location where the photo was taken. They discovered one photo had the GPS coordinates of a shopping center in Toronto called the Eaton Center. Since the photo was taken in 2010 and the cat video came out the same year, they had proof that Luca was most likely in Toronto. John found a photo of Luca on a condo balcony near an intersection with a gas station in the background. He began to cross-reference all the Petro-Canada gas stations in the area and discovered that there were thousands. However, he recalled a post that Luca made where he was complaining that paparazzi were trying to take his photo while at his condo in Etobeco. He then cross-referenced Petro Canada gas stations in Etobeco and realized that there were only six. And through Google Maps, he found the location of the photo. At this point, he contacted Toronto police, who went to the residence to inquire about Luca, only to have someone tell him that, yes, he used to live here, but he had since moved to Russia. A few weeks went by as the leads died out and the group was unsure what to do next. 
That is, until two more videos were posted to the main group of a cat being drowned in a bathtub and another cat being stalked and eaten by a python in the same bedroom as one boy, two kittens. Both videos reference the Moore's murders, which were a pair of child serial killers in England. A London English newspaper called The Sun picked up the story and wrote an article asking the public if they recognized the person in the videos. One of the reporters, Alex West, received a message from another fake account, telling him that the person he was looking for was Luca Magnata, and he could be found at the Facilier Inn in London. Alex headed there and found Luca. He had a wire attached to him as he began speaking with Luca, asking him if he was the one in the videos. Luca responded that it was not him and that many people were trying to frame him and ruin his career, but he would not mention who these people were. After the meeting, Alex received an email from John Kilbride, one of the children who were murdered by the Moors. The email claimed that he would be creating more movies soon, and this time, it would include humans. Unfortunately, the Scotland Yard was out of jurisdiction and could not assist with the investigation into Luca. Many of the group members were worried that Luca was going to take this to the next level and end the life of a person next. That was when another fake account posted a comment to the group, referring to Deanna, and one of the videos the fake account was connected to was a home video filming the casino she worked at. Now she felt things had gotten extremely serious because she could potentially be his next victim. Fortunately for her, he had selected someone else. In May of 2012, a video was uploaded to the internet titled One Lunatic, One Ice Pick which depicted 10 minutes of an individual having his life brutally ended with an ice pick and a knife. Then the killer saws off the body parts, including the head, and performs despicable acts on the body. The video quickly became viral, with people resharing their reactions to the video, many believing that there was no way this could be real. John sent the video to the Toronto police officer he had been in touch with when he found the Etobeck address, and they assumed a body would be found, but nothing came of it. The internet sleuths decided to take matters into their own hands once again, and while rifling through the many images that Luca uploaded to the internet of himself, they found an image with unique black streetlights in the background. As they googled streetlights across Canada, they discovered similar lights in Montreal, Quebec. The pair began searching the streets of Montreal via Google Maps to find the location of the photo. After hours of searching, John came across a set of steps leading up to McGill University in downtown Montreal, and he immediately recognized it as the location where the photo was taken. Unbeknownst to the internet sleuths, a call was made to Montreal police not long after the video was uploaded, that a janitor for a small apartment building on the west end of Montreal found a large suitcase near the trash with flies and other insects around it. Montreal police immediately rushed to the scene and blocked off the area. Inside that suitcase, the forensic officer found the torso of a male. Simultaneously, a postal worker discovered a box with smeared blood in transit to the Liberal Government Party of Canada, containing a severed foot. A hand was discovered in a package sent to the Conservative Government Party of Canada's national headquarters, with a poem inside, reading, Roses are red, violets are blue, police will need dental records to identify you. The other foot and hand were later found sent to public schools in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. The forensic officer at the scene of the torso also found numerous trash bags containing items from the murder. Blood-soaked clothing and bedding, a deceased puppy, 
the legs and arms of the individual, and several items of paperwork with information regarding none other than Luca Magnata. It seemed he had hit an all-time low in a disgusting attempt for notoriety. The police found the exact address of the building in the bags and went up to search the apartment. Originally, the police assumed the torso was that of Luca himself. However, when they arrived at the apartment, they discovered the entire place was cleaned with chemical cleaners and empty. The only clue was a comment written in red sharpie inside of the closet that read, if you don't like the reflection, don't look in the mirror. I don't care. At this point, they needed a search warrant, so they left the apartment and headed back to the police department. Detective Sergeant Antonia Paradiso from Montreal Homicide was put on the case, and he began talking with the building manager about the building's security. Luckily for them, the building had cameras at the front of the building and at the back, by the garbage area. The detective began sifting through the videotapes and discovered an individual who visited the trash bins over 20 times in one night. Not only that, but the t-shirt he was wearing was found in the bags as well. Investigators quickly identified the individual in the apartment building security tapes as Luca, and an international manhunt was underway to find him. At the same time that this investigation was going on, a man named Jun Lin, also known as Justin or Patrick Lin, was reported missing by his family back in Wuhan, China. He was an international student studying at Concordia University in Montreal for his undergraduate degree in engineering and computer science. His friends described him as kind but naive. By June 13, 2012, the body parts were identified as Jun after family members provided their DNA. However, his head remained missing until July 1st, when it was found in Montreal's Angregnon Park. When investigators searched the database for Luca's name, they discovered he used his own passport to leave the country shortly after the incident. The ticket was purchased for Paris, France. With all hands on deck, investigators contacted the French police and continued their search for Luca in France. Over 40 officers began searching for Luca. They knew his outfit from the Montreal airport CCTV, so the officers in France watched their airport footage as well and discovered he had caught a taxi. Police tracked down the driver, who said he dropped the individual off at a hotel called Novotel. Unfortunately for the police, he didn't actually spend the night there. He was seen on CCTV walking away into the night with his luggage. Three years prior, Luca had written another blog post about ways to evade the police. The first step was to cut ties with everyone you know. The second step was to liquidate all your money into cash. The third step was to retrieve false identity documents. Ironically, he didn't take his own advice. Canadian police alerted the French police that Luca had used his credit card in Paris. Luca contacted an internet friend named John Christophe, who let him sleep on his couch. Christophe contacted the police after seeing Luca's face on the news and provided them with a phone number he was using. police searched the area where the phone was purchased and found a seedy motel where Luca had booked an eight-night stay under the name Kurt Trammell. 
Police knew they were close, but they realized he was using a new identity now. They found discarded identification and the t-shirt he was seen wearing on CCTV in the room, but no Luca. The following Monday morning, an internet cafe worker in Berlin, Germany was minding his own business when a man walked into the cafe. He enjoyed reading the news and quickly realized it was the butcher from Montreal, which was the nickname Europeans gave him. The man showed him the computer and pretended to clean up the cafe while he watched the individual. When he walked behind him, he noticed that the man was looking at the Luca Magnata Interpol warrant and knew for sure that the butcher of Montreal was sitting right in front of him. He walked out into the street and hailed an officer down. Soon, 10 German police entered the cafe to arrest Luca. Ironically, Luca was caught because he was so obsessed with himself that he had to know what was happening with his case. When he was arrested, they had to send the Canadian military to bring him back to Canada because not one airline wanted to be associated with him. When he got back to Canada, police obtained him and began their interviews. Luca pretended that there was another person involved named Manny Lopez who was forcing him to do all of the horrendous things he did. Years prior, there was evidence that he contacted Florida police and an attorney said he was being harmed by someone named Manny, but nothing was ever pursued. In the Netflix docuseries, Luca's mother is a main character and completely believes that her son was forced to do these things. The main The major crack in this story is all the lies he told about his mother, and now she's here as his number one savior. If Luca was lying about the things he claimed his mother did to him, then what else was he lying about? In March of 2013, Luca's pre-trial began, and Jun's parents arrived from China to see the events play out. His family members shed several tears listening to the explanation of their son's horrific life-ending event. Luca pulled all the chaos strings and at one point fainted into a fetal position while the court described his horrific crimes. The trial was set for September 2014, and when the date arrived, Luca pled guilty to what he did, but claimed he was not in the right frame of mind at the time, otherwise known as an insanity plea. With over 60 witnesses, the trial carried on for two months before they finally decided on the verdict. Luca was found guilty of ending Jun's life and received life in prison. In the end, the prosecution read Jun's father's victim impact statement, saying, In one night, we lost a lifetime of hope, our futures, parts of our past. We do not want to tell our story because it is too sad to repeat. We cannot talk much about Lin Jun without talking about his murder. The murder has robbed us not only of Lin Jun, but our ability to think and talk about him without feeling pain and shame. Luca did not testify during the trial, nor did he apologize at any time to Jun's family. Although his lawyers were convinced he was in psychosis when he ended Jun's life, they were relieved to know he was in a place where he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. And the story of Manny Lopez? If you're a fan of the film Basic Instinct, you'll know the main character's name is Catherine Trammell. Her ex-boyfriend's name is Manny Vasquez. When Luca left Paris for Berlin, he changed his name to Kirk Trammell. It was all a long, drawn-out love letter to what even his mother claimed is his favorite movie, Basic Instinct. Even the viral video of his horrific crime was laid out in the same way that the intro to Basic Instinct is, where Sharon Stone ends Manny's life with an ice pick. No telephone records proved Manny ever existed. His lawyers never used his alibi of Manny to corroborate his story. The rest of Luca's life is blank. As he sits in prison withering away, the only glimpse of him on the inside is a dating profile on Canadian Inmates Connect, Inc., where he says he's looking for his intelligent Prince Charming. But sharing his story over and over again makes him that much more infamous. So are we to blame for keeping his story alive? Let us know in the comments what you think about this crime. The internet sleuths tried to tell police about Luca for 18 months before he ended Jun's life. Do you think if they acted sooner, he wouldn't have killed? Regardless, animal cruelty is disgusting, and the atrocities he acted upon innocent animals were horrendous. 
What do you think about all of his lies? Do you believe what he said about his mother? Do you think Manny actually existed? As always, don't forget to click that notification bell, like the video, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.